Hi, Dr. Stan again. Welcome back to our uh, uh, free training and, and equipping and education in the area of dealing with this difficult topic of domestic violence. Um, we mentioned a, a, a case study early on. It was by far, it was an actual, it's a true case study. You know, the names have been changed to, and, and all of that to uh, protect the guilty and the innocent. But you know, there's uh, been lots and lots of cases that I've had to deal with over the years dealing with domestic violence. Probably one of the most impactful ones was, uh, you know, a gal named Sally was uh, it's just an interesting referral. She was referred to me uh, by a, a former client of mine who had convinced her that based upon the story she had shared about what was happening in her life that she really needed to get some some help. I remember when she first came for the visit. I mean, she was not a a, a very well kept woman. I mean, she was. I mean, she wasn't unattractive. She was not, you know, terribly overweight or anything like that. But she just, she had old clothes. She didn't wear any makeup. Her hair was not really done much. In fact, it was up in a bun, kind of in an, what we'd call an old Pentecostal style uh, haircut. And I found out that she was actually a part of a very uh, kind of fundamentalist uh, Pentecostal charismatic church. Nothing against that. Uh, but anyway, that's the, the church that she was a part of. Uh, she was married to uh, a young man that was a deacon in the church. He was also involved on the music team, etc. And as far as uh, his pastor was concerned, was just, just this greatest guy. But apparently what was happening at home was not so good. I mean, uh, Sally worked really, really hard to provide a, a good home. Uh, part of that good home was making sure if at all possible, the meal was prepared and on the table, you know, by a certain time, usually by five o'clock at night. And occasionally, because of having to take care of kids, they, they had two kids, uh, it was just not always possible for her to have everything ready just in time. And whenever it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't just he was disappointed, he would get violent. The violence first started is just yelling and put down statements that, you know, you're, what kind of woman are you? you? You're not good enough. And, you know, I work all the time and this isn't right. And shame, 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 shame. And, and because, uh, you know, Sally was a woman that didn't have a lot of education and really didn't have a lot of self-esteem, uh, she just took it and said, oh, you know, and apologize and I'll try harder and I'll try and be better. Well, the verbal eventually escalated to some physical and eventually not just a little physical, but even, I mean, he punched her a couple times to a place where she had to go to the hospital. And that's when her friend kind of intervened, said, this is not right. You, you know, I mean, he's supposed to be a Christian and you're a part of a church. What, you know, what's going on here? Well, she was very reluctant. She went to her pastor. Again, this is not common of pastors, and I'm not, this is not an indictment against pastors. But this pastor was somewhat of a Cro-Magnon man. I mean, he, his statement to her when she went to visit him and explain what was going on was, well, if you were a better wife, then probably he wouldn't have the need to, to put you in your place. I don't know what place he was talking about. Purgatory, perhaps. But he, he really didn't have a clear picture of what was going on. Uh, later I found out that his primary concern was this was this young man was a pretty good tither and the last thing he wanted to do was to lose a tither and a musician and a deacon etc. So he didn't want anything reported, he didn't want anything dealt with, but dealing with it, it had to happen. Now, it didn't have to happen necessarily legally because of the domestic violence. I mean that I mean, you, it's reportable in many situations, but in, at the day, it wasn't a reportable offense. But we did find out that not only was he abusing her physically, but he was also sneaking in and, and abusing sexually the, their daughter. When I reported it, 
which I had to do. I'm a mandated reporter in the state of California and followed it up with a report and all that goes into that. I mean, the stuff did hit the fan. I, I still remember the phone call I received from the pastor. How dare you do this to our per, you know, parishioner? This is a church matter. Well, I said, you know, I'm sorry, but it's not just a church matter. It's now a legal matter. He didn't seem to have a whole lot of concern about the, the daughter or the wife. It was predominantly about the church and their reputation. Well, you know, again, that's an unusual case. I understood the crisis, you know, and most people don't know what to do in the middle of a crisis like that. But I just want to give you, just by way of help, uh, four steps, if you will, to dealing with a crisis like this in an effective way. And it's just called the ABCD method of crisis evaluation and intervention. Number one, it starts by achieving a relationship. One of the things that I had, of course, with this young lady is I had a relationship with her. And when everything went sideways, I mean, her whole life went sideways. He was sole support. She didn't have a job. She didn't know what to do. So part of my responsibility, because of my relationship with her, was to help her develop a strategy to deal with the first few days, first few weeks. And fortunately, she had some good friends, one of which was the, the gal that had referred her for the counseling, came alongside to, to help her in the initial stage of this crisis in their life. But you have to, first of all, be able to achieve a relationship. And, you know, there's some relational skills that can be learned. And we're, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the course that we're going to be offering. But those relational skills are key to helping people to deal with a crisis, especially the crisis of domestic violence. Number two is you've got to boil down the problem. What's the real problem? The real problem in this case was she needed a place to live. Uh, we needed to deal with, you know, the, the actual circumstances of the abuse. Uh, we didn't have to deal with all the theology. Theology wasn't the most important thing. Safety was by far the most important thing. And so we boiled it down to we need to make sure that she's safe, Sally's safe, her daughter's safe, her son was safe. Um, and we'll let the, the police and other folks deal with the husband. I mean, we weren't angry at the husband in the sense of, you know, shame. No, we recognized most likely uh, he had been abused. He was probably also a victim. He needed ministry. Uh, it just unfortunately for him, it was most likely going to end up as jail ministry, but still ministry he would need as well. So we weren't throwing him to the streets, but by far she and the kids were more important. And so we boiled down the problem, developed a safety plan to help. Um, the third thing is, is, is to challenge people to positive action. One of the things that often happens in a domestic violence situation is uh, the person has developed learned helplessness. And that was true for Sally. She felt absolutely um, unable to act, unable to, to make a decision. Again, you don't want to make decisions for adults. Children, that's different. But for adults, you don't want to make the decision for them. You want them to make a good decision. So you have to be able to challenge them. And you, you Many ways you do that with laying out the options for them and, and what the potential consequences are for one choice over another. We challenged Sally that you know, she needed to, to make arrangements, she needed to take certain steps for her safety, uh, and over a short period of time she was able to rise to that challenge uh, and things began to get better. After that, then you develop an ongoing plan. And, and the ongoing plan for her was to continue in, in counseling. Eventually, she had to deal with the marriage. Our hope would be that ultimately the husband would repent. I mean, she didn't really want to get rid of him. She actually loved the guy, even considering what he had done, including to her daughter. I mean, it's, it's amazing the level of love that some people have and the, the sense of commitment they have to their covenant. But unfortunately, and this young man decided, no, if you're going to betray me like this, I don't want anything to do with the marriage. And he suffered the consequences of his actions in terms of 
the consequences with the police, but also he made the choice to move ahead with divorce. I, it's good to know, though, that eventually, over time, it took two or three years later, Sally found herself a, a really fine Christian young man. They went on to, and to this day, they've had a very, very successful life in marriage. God can bring about restoration in the most difficult of situations. You know, I, I, we've got another free resource for you that we'd like for you to consider just downloading. You'll see the link to download. It's just called Crisis a Christian response to crisis. And this talks about the ABCD model, but also about grief and loss and some other things. And we just want you to have this as a gift uh, from our ministry to you. I mean, if you're interested in helping people to deal with crisis situations, this little booklet has got some real nuggets in it to help you in that regard. It's something you can also share with people in your church, etc. Hey, look, in, in our next video, we're going to talk more about, you know, how do we uh, really help people and what does it take to become really equipped to deal with issues related to domestic violence. So I, I hope you'll look forward to the, the next email, the next video. I'm looking forward to sharing my thoughts with you there.